the Ambassador Series is brought to you in part by Prairie Heart Institute, the University of Illinois at Springfield, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Ambassador Series. My name is Paul Palazzolo, your Sangamon County Auditor and a volunteer for WSEC, and I'll be serving as your host for today's program. This program is a presentation of WSCC TV in cooperation with the University of Illinois Springfield. The television portion of the program is sponsored in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and through the support of the viewers of WSCC TV. It will be broadcast by WSCC and other PBS stations throughout the state. We encourage you to support WSCC TV in Springfield so that they can continue to bring you programs like this that educate, inspire, and entertain. Now please allow me to take a few moments to introduce the head table to you. To my right and your left is Dr. Gerald Grubel, President and CEO of WSCC TV. To my left is David Racine, Executive Director for the UIS Center for State Policy and Leadership. And also to my left is today's honored guest. His Excellency, Peter Gondolovich, Ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States, was born in Prague and educated at Charles University in Prague, specializing in mathematics and physics. Following three years as a mathematics and physics teacher at the high school of Usti nad Labem, the Ambassador served as a member of the Federal Assembly of the Czech and Slovak Federal Republic, followed by various posts in the Ministries of the Environment and Foreign Affairs. From 1997 to 2002, he served as Consul General of the Czech Republic in New York and then service as Mayor of the City of Usti nad Labem from 2002 to 2006. During his service as a member of the Chamber of Deputies in the Parliament of the Czech Republic from 2006 to 2011, the Ambassador was Minister of Regional Development and Minister of Agriculture and a member of the Agriculture and Foreign Committees. Following his return to the United States as Ambassador of the Czech Republic on May 20, 2011, he officially presented his credentials to President Barack Obama on July 7, 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Peter Gondolovich. <laughs> Ambassador, welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would uh, like to say how privileged I am to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. And uh, I also wish to apologize uh, to those of you who uh, were invited to the Ambassador Series uh, in May this year, because I was supposed to appear and we had to cancel at the very last moment uh, because of a uh, mm, unfortunate and sad event in my own family. So again, I'm so happy to be here uh, today and uh, to be able to speak to you about uh, whatever you're interested in. But uh, before I uh, leave it to your questions and answers, I wish to share with you uh, some thoughts about the current situation in uh, Europe. I was uh, sort of uh, thinking what should I uh, tell you about the Czech Republic itself. But then I realized that uh, you all read uh, this uh, very well prepared uh, leaflet. So uh, you pretty much uh, know all about uh, the Czech Republic by now. And there isn't any need to, uh, uh, to tell you more. There is one thing I just uh, wish to, uh, you know, not to correct, but maybe make a little comment on, because it says that uh, uh, the Czechs are the number one uh, beer drinking nation in the world, uh, consuming the most beer per capita in the world. Well, it's something you don't know if you, um, uh, if you should brag about, but uh, I uh, 
want to make one uh, concession that this is uh, not only by Czechs, uh, uh, but uh, by uh, the tourists uh, that the whole uh, 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 that the whole figure is uh, created because you know that Prague has become uh, such a destination of uh, tourists uh, from all around the world and I um, uh, mm, I think that uh, many of them are coming just uh, for the beer and so they are improving our um, uh, consumption figures it doesn't actually say that uh, we are another number one uh, nation per capita, which is uh, in uh, auto industry. Uh, some statistics say that the Czechs uh, make more cars per capita than the US, which is, um, as you can imagine, both uh, a blessing uh, when times are good, as well as uh, a curse uh, uh, when times uh, are not uh, as good uh, because uh, mm, uh, obviously the uh, auto industry uh, suffers uh, first when economic downturn appears uh, and this is the situation we've been uh, now in Europe, in both in Europe and in the US. Some people ask me if it can be compared uh, the situation in Europe and in the US in terms of the depth, uh, depth of uh, uh, the crisis and um, the amount of death. Uh, and I think that uh, mm, uh, for some, uh, from some uh, uh, point of view, it may be compared. Obviously, uh, the uh, death that's been accumulated on both sides of the Atlantic is uh, really uh, worrying and uh, the U.S. is lucky that uh, the markets has, uh, are not as worried about uh, your debt as they are worried about the European debt. Even though in absolute figures, uh, these uh, figures are comparable. And um, the other um, argument I'm going to make is that uh, uh, the situation in Europe is uh, much more complicated uh, uh, because it's not only an economic crisis, it's uh, also a challenge uh, in terms of uh, the whole structure of Europe as uh, a continent or as a European Union, as an organization of 27 states. And um, so while uh, you really uh, do need to uh, deal with uh, the fiscal cliff and with uh, uh, the tax reform and uh, uh, balancing the budget, these are all uh, quite uh, standard uh, political questions uh, uh, with which uh, political parties are able to deal with uh, with their mandates uh, uh, getting uh, or that they have gotten from their voters. In Europe, uh, the economic crisis of the Eurozone has brought about uh, pretty much a question uh, how far uh, the integration of the continent uh, should go and uh, sometimes it's uh, actually uh, uh, some sort of uh, an easy, uh, it seems that uh, an easy answer uh, may be at hand that uh, the more integration in Europe uh, uh, the, uh, the easier uh, uh, we will uh, handle the crisis and uh, mm, I see it as a, as a very uh, difficult thing and uh, uh, it uh, gives us a lot of concerns because uh, if you look at uh, the development in Europe uh, over the all uh, uh, 50 years you see that uh, the integrational process has been a very delicate uh, one in which uh, all the different uh, uh, individual states interests and traditions and, uh, and uh, mm, philosophies uh, uh, mm, had their own influence and it really went uh, very slowly because if you look at the uh, first creation of uh, so-called uh, European communities in the 50s and you go all the long way uh, until the Maastricht Treaty in early 90s when European communities uh, were transformed into 
uh, European Union. And now uh, we have uh, a situation after the Lisbon Treaty that has uh, brought about even more integration. And now it seems like the time is shrinking in terms of uh, uh, the tempo and uh, the pace of uh, integration because uh, over a number of months as a result of, uh, uh, of the economic crisis of the Eurozone, there are uh, uh, proposals that go far and far beyond uh, uh, what has been achieved uh, during this lengthy process of integration. If somebody says about, uh, talk, talks about uh, banking union, it's, a, uh, it's basically a centralized uh, banking oversight uh, uh, over uh, the entire Eurozone and possibly over the entire uh, European Union. It actually means that you have one uh, administration that uh, uh, exercises this oversight. If uh, you hear about fiscal union, it uh, basically means that there is certain uh, uh, authority uh, that goes over the uh, heads of uh, um, the elected officials, uh, uh, elected uh, members of parliaments of the member states and uh, basically tells them uh, how uh, big uh, their uh, deficit may or may not be. So this is a very uh, mm, a significant way of uh, integration that is uh, actually made under the Democles uh, sword of uh, the markets. And you may follow that uh, European leaders always uh, convene uh, Thursdays or, or, or Fridays and uh, uh, holding their talks uh, until late uh, uh, Friday night or even Saturday morning because they are worried uh, what, will be, uh, what would be the reaction of the markets uh, when they open Monday. So this is really a worrisome situation because it's uh, actually uh, uh, not uh, a natural development of an integration of the continent, but it's uh, something that takes place under some sort of uh, pressure and uh, threat of uh, uh, of the economic uh, uh, repercussions of uh, some sort of step. So uh, the question is, does Europe need uh, further integration? I think yes, it does. But uh, another question, how to arrive uh, to uh, such a bigger level of integration and is it gonna uh, happen any uh, soon in any foreseeable future? I don't think so. I think that it will take a lot of time it will be a um, difficult and long uh, process and I hope that uh, this very uh, crisis of Euro uh, will not um, uh, uh, make away with all these uh, good things we have achieved as a European Union because uh, it might, uh, uh, it's um, very unjust that uh, people look at European Union through uh, the perspective of the Euro crisis because there are so many good things that have been achieved uh, during the European integration. The first and most important is that uh, there has not been any war uh, between uh, European countries at all and that uh, you uh, see uh, the uh, uh, public uh, of, uh, or the citizens of uh, uh, European countries uh, to really become closer and closer and to be free to, uh, to find uh, uh, their residence, uh, a new job uh, all across uh, the whole continent. So this makes uh, Europe uh, uh, closer and maybe future generations will actually uh, agree on even, uh, uh, even a narrower or a closer cooperation. But uh, uh, these days, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, um, uh, any uh, any uh, uh, soon uh, uh, coming any soon, and this is uh, something I wish to leave for your uh, thoughts and questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to discussing with you. Thank you. First question, Ambassador. During your years in the United States, 
what observations about our auto industry have you seen and do you see any Czech Republic auto industry lessons that could be applied? Well, it is a really a challenge. I mean, uh, I don't think that the Czech auto industry can uh, be giving any lessons to uh, um, uh, America, which is the cradle of auto industry ever. So, um, well, of course, um, uh, uh, Czech automakers, and uh, if we are talking about uh, them in such a detail, I may want to tell you that the biggest uh, automaker is uh, Škoda, uh, a member of uh, uh, the Volkswagen family and that uh, automaker uh, makes uh, all the entire line uh, from the small compact uh, up to uh, mid, uh, mid size or uh, I would say uh, hi uh, higher end luxury cars including uh, uh, the uh, SUVs. Uh, it has uh, survived the crisis because uh, of its expansion uh, to the east, Russia and China. And that has made them uh, strong and uh, being able to uh, survive the drop in demand uh, in, uh, in Europe. As far as uh, what I've been observing, I mean, of course the question is uh, uh, the consumption, the mileage. In Europe we have uh, definitely been uh, much uh, uh, much more modest in uh, consumptions and I think that this trend has been uh, gradually prevalent uh, even in the US uh, so that's my uh, my uh, observation maybe uh, the hybrids will be the mm, uh, answer I don't know I'm not an expert I'm just a user <laughs> Ambassador what is the largest change you have seen since the withdrawal of the former Soviet Union from Eastern Europe for the Czech Republic and neighboring countries? Well, this question would take another whole uh, presentation because uh, obviously uh, everything has changed. Uh, you have to appreciate that uh, for uh, 40 years uh, uh, we lived under the uh, totalitarian regime and under a very thorough control of not only our Communist Party but uh, also uh, the Soviet uh, uh, agents and uh, mm, mm, Soviet influence. So uh, uh, mm, lives uh, mm, uh, were, uh, lives of many people were uh, just ruined. I mean from uh, the 50s when uh, people really uh, were uh, uh, executed for their political beliefs throughout uh, the Prague Spring when people believed that there was some way of, uh, uh, of improving and uh, um, restoring the all humanitarian uh, humanistic idea of uh, socialism uh, it didn't work either and it was uh, then uh, crushed by the Soviet tanks until the 70s when uh, nobody believed in anything because even the communists uh, uh, simply pretended that they uh, believed in the communism uh, in order to stay in power and uh, uh, and uh, stay in an advantageous uh, position. So I think that um, the very uh, short and candid answer is that uh, everything changed, everything. With changes coming in the U.S. healthcare system, please comment on your country's system and one thing that we could learn from it. Well, I certainly skip that uh, uh, mentoring part again uh, because I think that uh, mm, uh, health care systems uh, uh, mm, just grow out of uh, uh, traditions, uh, out of uh, uh, mm, certain values every society uh, develops uh, throughout many many years. Of course uh, there is some sort of universal uh, uh, meaning of, um, of the health care. Uh, it's an utmost uh, humane and civilizational thing obviously. So in some uh, sense of the word uh, the systems of the Western countries might uh, may con 
verge into some sort of uh, uh, um, system of insurance and system of uh, medical uh, uh, care providers. In our country, uh, and again, um, uh, I have to start with the socialist regime. Obviously, everything was state-run, uh, not um, only uh, uh, the industry, but uh, of course, uh, uh, all the social and healthcare system in the first place. So um, every doctor was an employee of the state, and every uh, every uh, crown uh, that was uh, given uh, for uh, the, uh, to the healthcare system uh, went through the state budget. After the uh, changes, uh, we created uh, a system of universal healthcare insurance that is basically something as uh, what we, you would call individual mandate. So every employee is uh, uh, obligated to arrange for a uh, uh, for a. Uh, uh, for an insurance, uh, being it a state-owned insurance company or a private insurance company, and uh, uh, both the employee as well as the employer uh, contribute uh, to this uh, insurance. And also uh, on the side of the medical health uh, 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 care providers, we have uh, state-owned hospitals. There are basically uh, uh, just uh, only a few of them. Uh, mostly these are something what you would compare with uh, NIH or something like that. So they are uh, connected with uh, universities. Uh, you have regional hospitals uh, that are publicly owned by um, the owner is the region. Uh, you might have even a town hospital, but there is a wide array of uh, private uh, hospitals as well as uh, uh, private uh, doctors' uh, offices, family doctors or uh, specialty doctors. So the system is uh, very uh, mm, uh, complex. Uh, obviously, it's uh, also challenged by the ever-existing uh, 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 contrast between a given amount of uh, money that flow into the system and ever-raising uh, ever, uh, uh, costs of uh, uh, prescription medicine as well as uh, uh, the costs of uh, the care itself. Not only the cost, but also the quality has improved tremendously. And the question is how to keep the quality uh, up and the cost uh, flat or something like that. So that's the uh, question if uh, we had an answer for we would definitely get a Nobel Prize or something <laughs> like that. <laughs>the situation in our country. Uh, the economy uh, has not been uh, mm, uh, tremendously uh, growing, uh, but it's not uh, falling uh, either. It's been, I would say, sluggish, uh, and it's uh, very much uh, dependent on uh, what's uh, going on in Germany and uh, the parts of Europe we uh, do most of our foreign trade with. As far as uh, the uh, situation in uh, uh, southern parts of Europe. I'm not going to comment on that, but on the other hand, I must say that uh, uh, we do have uh, our unions. Uh, they obviously um, sharply criticize what the government has been doing in terms of cutting uh, the public uh, expenditures uh, and, uh, um, you know, um, trying to uh, raise these questions. Uh, in the public uh, discourse, but on the other hand, we do not see that uh, much of uh, uh, protests and uh, even violence as we see in some of these parts of Europe. Thank you, Ambassador. What is your government's tax structure and can you compare it to the United States? 
In general, uh, uh, the tax uh, system consists of um, uh, all uh, uh, three uh, uh, basic taxes. Uh, 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 the corporate tax, uh, the personal income tax, and uh, what you have here is uh, a sales tax in our country and in most of Europe it is uh, the value added tax. Uh, and then uh, uh, what you know as uh, local tax or uh, real estate tax doesn't make uh, uh, much of, uh, um, of an income for the community. So uh, the communities for the most part are finance uh, in terms of uh, uh, fixed uh, percentages uh, uh, redistributed by uh, the central government uh, to the regions and to the communities. And these per percentages are of course the banner of, uh, of uh, um, fierce uh, debates, but uh, uh, in fact it means that uh, the state uh, or the government uh, uh, collects uh, some amount of uh, 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 the VAT returns and then it uh, redistributes uh, some portions of it regardless of uh, where these uh, monies were collected from uh, um, to communities and regions accordingly to population. So uh, it is a question to what extent we should uh, return to a situation where uh, um, you know a more um, uh, business friendly environment may create more tax return and eventually may benefit to a community. This has uh, been a little bit uh, mm, uh, mm, sort of flattened. Uh, uh, communities receive uh, uh, tax returns uh, according to, the, uh, to their population, not to how many businesses uh, uh, mm, we have. That's a different thing, obviously. The point is that uh, um, in the Czech Republic, that is not a big uh, country. Uh, most of the uh, big businesses are located in uh, very few uh, uh, um, um, agglomerations, uh, very few uh, uh, big cities, which means that uh, uh, the tax uh, distribution would be, uh, would be uh, unjust. As far as uh, uh, tax uh, rates, uh, uh, We've been trying to uh, uh, shift the burden from uh, direct taxation towards indirect taxation. In other words, uh, we have uh, a relatively low uh, personal income tax. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it's a flat rate uh, regardless of uh, the income itself. It is effective of uh, 19%. And then uh, the corporate tax is also 19%. And uh, the uh, value added tax, on the other hand, uh, is uh, uh, 15 and 21, which is uh, substantially more than your sales tax. So you see this uh, sort of uh, uh, bigger emphasis on uh, consumption rather than uh, taxing uh, uh, production or productivity. Uh, it's a public. Uh, public debate in our country, obviously. Uh, you have to uh, take into consideration that we have had uh, uh, center-right uh, governments uh, for last uh, uh, six years now. So this, is, this has been the result of, uh, of um, some sort of a conservative uh, approach uh, towards uh, taxation. Ambassador, would you please explain the relationship between the Czech form of currency and the European Euro. Is the Czech Republic part of the European Union but keeps their own currency as does England? Well, the latter uh, question, the answer is yes. Uh, we are among uh, 10 European member states uh, that uh, do not use uh, Euro. Of course, the most, uh, uh, most uh, known is uh, actually UK, but uh, you may not know that uh, Sweden and Denmark uh, belong to this group, and also other seven uh, new member states. But uh, I do not uh, want to uh, name all, but I mean that this phenomenon of not using euro doesn't go 
on uh, the division line between the old and new member states, but uh, goes uh, somehow across. Uh, uh, you might not know that uh, Slovakia, the former uh, partner of uh, Czechs in the federal Czechoslovakia, now uses Euro. Uh, Slovenia, one of the uh, smallest uh, member states, uh, the, uh, one of the former Yugoslavian uh, uh, states, is using Euro, and Estonia, uh, that is one of the three Baltic states uh, uses Euro. So again, uh, using Euro doesn't uh, go with the, the division of uh, old and uh, new uh, European states, but it's a purely uh, political and an economic uh, decision by each, uh, each uh, uh, given member state. As far as the relationship between the crown and Euro and perhaps the dollar, um, it's a floating uh, exchange rate, which means that uh, uh, it can perhaps uh, 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 contribute to, uh, uh, mm, you know, making sure that uh, uh, Czech economy is uh, uh, or stays uh, competitive, uh, unlike those countries who have obviously adopted, adopted Euro, uh, they have uh, sort of given up to this uh, uh, possibility. And uh, even though it has been floating exchange rate, it's been relatively stable. Uh, the exchange rate towards the dollar is 1 to 19, 1 to 20 or something. The exchange rate towards euro is 1 to 24, 25. Do you believe the European, European Union will survive? Yes, I do believe that the European Union will survive. As I uh, said in my opening remarks, uh, it has been a project that has brought about uh, peace, uh, understanding uh, through, uh, throughout most of the continent. Uh, it uh, has brought uh, uh, the uh, four liberties that really do exist. It's, uh, freedom of uh, movement uh, of uh, uh, people and uh, money and capital and uh, um, uh, labor force. So you really can uh, make your own uh, decision where do you want to live uh, within the, uh, the European Union uh, 27 uh, member states. You can uh, get a job and uh, make it uh, a residence in this uh, uh, given country and you can start your business and you can move your uh, company there. So it's been really a project that uh, uh, mm, if you look at European history is a sort of a uh, miracle uh, from the perspective of, uh, of uh, the centuries. Uh, uh, if you compare it what uh, what was happening in Europe and uh, and uh, um, between um, individual states. On the other hand, again, as I said, uh, unfortunately, the project of uh, uh, the common currency uh, that was adopted uh, uh, in a certain rush uh, under uh, a certain situation where economy uh, was strong and nobody, uh, nobody actually expected uh, uh, such a development uh, to happen so soon. I think that it is a sad thing that uh, the Euro crisis is now sort of overshadowing uh, uh, the um, European integration as such and people question whether or not the European Union will survive. I mean if the question said if the Euro will survive I will not be that uh, mm, sure and that optimistic but uh, still I would probably say yet it will survive uh, uh, against all economic uh, uh, um, advices that it would be probably easier for Greece to, uh, to leave the European currency zone. But uh, on the other hand, as it is so much political thing, it's uh, not easy. And I think that uh, there will be more willingness to keep even the euro uh, together. And I hope that uh, I can really again reassure that I believe that the European Union will indeed survive. 
Ambassador, as the transition from Czechoslovakia to the independent Czech Republic considered complete, or are there elements that are still in transition? Oh, well, I think this um, question might be a little confusing because these are two things uh, in one question. First, it is a transition, uh, transition from uh, the uh, totalitarian regime, 100% uh, state-owned economy uh, towards a standard uh, Western world democracy. And I think that this transition obviously for the most part has been completed and uh, of course there are some uh, residuum uh, in the process. Uh, uh, there are uh, some unfinished uh, jobs but uh, for the most part uh, um, if you look at the data, if you look at the structure of the uh, Czech economy, of the Czech uh, democracy, uh, you just can't uh, find any uh, major uh, differences between any given Western uh, world uh, uh, democracies. As far as uh, Czech Republic versus Czechoslovakia, you know that we used to be a common state together with uh, the Slovaks. Uh, the two nations uh, created uh, the first independent Czechoslovakia uh, in 1918 after the end of the First World War. And you remember, oh, no, I, mean, I don't mean remember, I mean, you know that, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> you know that in, uh, in those days uh, the Allies uh, were um, very much concerned about uh, allowing uh, every single nation in Europe to create its own state. So there was a tendency to sort of bundle. And um, President Masaryk, together with uh, General Stefanik, uh, uh, who represented uh, Slovakia, um, made an agreement that uh, uh, an independent uh, uh, one state will be created for both uh, the two nations of the Czechs and Slovaks, and of course uh, a, a um, very much uh, important uh, German minority in those days. And after the changes uh, in 1989, uh, um, Slovak uh, self-awareness has uh, basically reached uh, such a level that uh, it became uh, imminent that uh, uh, the Federation wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't going to function well. And uh, uh, talks were held uh, uh, actually just uh, uh, 20 years ago uh, between the representations of the two states or two nations and uh, it uh, resulted in, in the division of uh, the uh, common state. So Czechoslovakia stopped to uh, uh, exist uh, in 1992 and uh, both the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic uh, began um, in January 1993. So this is uh, why this question actually um, probably confuses the transition from the uh, um, uh, totalitarian regime towards democracy uh, that has been accomplished in both states and the division of uh, the common state that uh, took place 20 years ago. Ambassador, what issues would there be for the Czech Republic if the United States were to go to the gold standard? Well, first, I don't think that the United States uh, ever will return to the gold standard. Secondly, uh, uh, I don't know how that will affect the world economy. Uh, it might uh, uh, very much uh, uh, affect the confidence of, um, of the creditors uh, towards uh, uh, the dollar, um, which uh, may eventually, uh, you know, uh, rebalance again uh, the markets towards the dollar, and uh, it uh, may eventually lead to less uh, interest of the markets towards euro. 
which actually has been the fact uh, for the most part uh, in the recent time because uh, even though uh, you lost your rating, you have uh, very much the same amount of debt uh, uh, compared to uh, the GDP. Uh, uh, your uh, bonds uh, trade well and the countries with the same amount of debt in Europe uh, uh, don't see uh, how they will um, sell their debt uh, uh, half a year from now. So this, is, this has been uh, you know, something that uh, really favors uh, investment into dollar. Um, as far as um, uh, the US-European relationship, I might wish to uh, point out uh, the fact that there isn't any free trade agreement between uh, Europe and the US while U.S. is looking elsewhere around the world, I think it is a time to overcome all sorts of uh, uh, um, uh, prejudices and uh, conflicts uh, between these two economies and uh, stop looking at both as competitors and rather try to create a transatlantic uh, uh, free trade area in order to uh, really keep it uh, stronger against uh, other uh, uh, emerging uh, European regions. Ambassador, with your educational background, how did you enter the political and diplomatic arenas? Well, it sounds like if somebody studies uh, mathematics and physics, uh, mm, uh, he or she uh, uh, isn't, isn't, expect, uh, isn't expected to, uh, to enter uh, diplomacy. Uh, mm, well, I, I think that uh, in our country uh, uh, things uh, mm, tumbled to some extent that uh, after the revolution obviously new people uh, emerged uh, in all sorts of walks of life and uh, went to public life as was my case, uh, I ran for uh, the first elected office as early as in 1990. That was the first elected federal assembly. And then eventually, maybe even by the virtue of uh, having uh, basically fired ourselves, because uh, as I said, as I told you about the division of the federal state, it was by uh, a law uh, Mm, that was debated uh, as a bill in the Federal Assembly and eventually voted for. So that uh, very same law that divided uh, the Federal Assembly, the uh, Supreme, Supreme Legislature, actually fired uh, the legislators. And this is when I was looking for a uh, position in the administration and I was uh, first uh, mm, with the Ministry of uh, Environment, and later on I joined the, uh, the Foreign Service. So it's, it's not that uh, mm, uh, mm, impossible. Uh, I think that, of course, uh, now it would be much more difficult uh, to join the Foreign Service because uh, obviously you have to study uh, uh, foreign relations, uh, uh, then uh, you have to pass uh, all sorts of uh, uh, competitions uh, um, uh, to enter uh, the foreign diplomatic uh, or the diplomatic academy. So the process is uh, obviously much more difficult and I am glad to that because uh, obviously we now produce uh, much more, uh, uh, much better educated uh, uh, diplomats uh, than I could ever dream of uh, my own background. Let's give the ambassador a round of applause. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you for sharing with us today and allowing us to learn a little bit more about the Czech Republic and your perspectives on our relationship. Thank you again, sir. And again, thank you for joining us for this edition of the Ambassador Series. We look forward to your future support of WSCC-TV. Thank you again. Good night.